After I joined the Army for my mandatory nine-month service, I was forcibly given the specialty of the cook. After some surprisingly harsh training, they sent me to an outpost where I had to do two daily services, one as a cook and one as an area observer, while everyone else did one to zero services, for about 50 days nonstop. That meant I was on my feet from 6 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. every single day, while getting 35 hours of sleep every night. Nobody helped me in any way. I did not have nearly enough time to prepare the food properly. They claimed it was not protocol to help the cook, and nobody cared, so naturally I got extremely tired and pissed off. One day I dared to protest my situation and also report some problems with the kitchen, lack of supplies in the oven itself, and was told to shut up, stop complaining, and do my job. So I decided to comply with the shut up and don't complain policy. What they didn't know was that I had found a trick to turn the oven on. It looked fine, but the food wouldn't cook at all. The next day, I was going to prepare a stuffed vegetables dish for 12 people, tomatoes and peppers stuffed with rice and minced meat. I put it in the oven and waited for four hours to not be cooked. I casually served the raw food, which had become mushy and rancid because it was summertime. The look on everyone's face when they tried to eat the first bite was absolutely priceless. They immediately snapped and started freaking out, yelling and screaming in anger like this was a common thing. Even though I had never failed a dish before and those arrogant, selfish pricks ate like kings every day. I maliciously smiled and told them that I lacked half of my supplies and the recipe was wildly incomplete. While the oven was malfunctioning, word reached the captain who also freaked out, but I told him that it was he who commanded me to shut up about the food problem. He said my failure should be reported and I agreed. I immediately called my unit and reported that I was being mistreated, overworked, sleepless, and ignored for 43 consecutive days. So this resulted to my failure. The next day, I heard the captain was reprimanded severely by our colonel commander for the shitty situation in his outpost. Of course, the next three days I did the exact same thing, and I starved the bastards to insanity. Afterwards, they were begging me to help me out with the food preparations, but I refused since I complied with its not protocol to help the cook policy which they claimed in the first place and kept feeding them disgusting, tasteless food under the excuse of a broken oven. They called the unit and cried that I'm holding them hostage with the food and I should be removed. The day I was removed one week later was the best day of my life. I haven't regretted anything and 100% would do it again. This was definitely back in 2019 around the end of July. I had just gotten fired in May at Home Depot because this particular manager absolutely hated that I was doing as well as I was. But this is for another thread. I had gone into Adit Wireless HE where I live for a walk and interview, which I nailed by the way, but beforehand I had gotten into a huge disagreement and a verbal fight with my own mother. Fast forward to after the interview, I was still shook up from the fight alone and I decided to stop by the mall. I shopped around to just see what was around. Note that I was still in my interview clothes, a collared white button-up shirt, black dress pants, and pink tie I wore at the funeral for my grandmother in 2015. It meant a lot to me and the people that had took this truly to heart and said they loved it. Cut to as I was leaving, I suddenly felt a hand rip into my shoulder and yank me backwards, but I also heard a loud rip on my shoulder. Lo and behold, the first true Karen I ever had the displeasure to meet. Just before I could say something, this is how things went. Karen, you need to leave right now and never come back here. I don't even know how you got out of prison, but you should be locked away for what you did. Me. I'm sorry. Who are you? Do you want me to call the police? There are children here and you shouldn't be around them. I don't know what the fungus growing from Shrek's toes you're talking about. Karen proceeded to yell at security while she pulled her phone out. Watch this pedo. I'm calling the police because he shouldn't be around here when there's so many kids around. She thought I was a pedophile because my bald head seemed to match it. But the rest of my body is at least twice as big as the criminal she thought I was. But the security guard said I should stay and give my side of the story to the police when they get there. I didn't want to but I was already in a bad enough mood and was ready to give it to her good. The guard in the first place was actually a good buddy of mine who sees me in there regularly anyways. Barely know him, but he's really cool. Cut to the police showing up. Karen ran up to them and started panicking, pointing at me. Before I knew it, they didn't even give me a chance to give my side of the story before they put me in cuffs. Luckily, Chad the guard, not his real name, explained the situation before the cops could arrest me. They ran my ID in a background check. It was clear... They uncuffed me and pulled up an actual photo of the pedo she thought I was. In the file, it even said he was six foot three. I was barely five foot seven, and the guy had a light brown beard. I have dark brown, almost black, and a goatee. Karen. No, you can't let him go. He's a pedophile. I saw him talking to kids in the GameStop. Me. He was with his mom, who happened to be a good friend of mine. If you're really that shallow to judge someone on how they look and who they talk to, you're just insane. 
and you ruined my shirt I wore to my grandmother's funeral. I will be pressing charges. The police collected her saying she was acting immature and apologized to me before taking her out to the car. This still shook me up and I can almost confirm this to be the reason why I have severe anxiety and low self-esteem. I was bullied through elementary, middle, and high school because I'm overweight and suddenly getting this from a woman in her 50s. She was charged with disturbance, unnecessary accusations, false emergency, and destruction of property, my $75 shirt. In the end, it was satisfying to see her carried off, but it still left me messed up in the head. My anxiety hasn't improved since, but I'm seeing a therapist for now. Okay, let me preface this story by stating the fact that I'm well aware that it sounds absolutely insane. I also don't really condone the behavior displayed therein, including my own. My family is a dumpster fire that gives trailer trash a bad name. And unfortunately, every word herein is true to the best of my recollection because it happened about 25 years or so ago. My grandmother started having children young. She married at 13 and had my father when she was 14, so she wasn't quite as old as other grandmothers by the time I was born. She had full custody of me from the day I was born. I never went home from the hospital with my parents, which meant that grandma was the only mother I ever had. My father and mother didn't want to raise me because they were too busy getting high to care about their baby, so they just gave me to her and bounced, which is why she had me to start with. It did not end well for me, but that's a topic for a whole other Reddit group. My grandmother has been dead 10 years now, and I still have nightmares about her, so that is a fair indication of the type of person she was. She was vicious and had a temper like a powder keg. One tiny spark, and it was on like Donkey Kong 100s of the time. She was also super possessive of me, to a degree that was a little terrifying. It bordered on obsession, and it was not healthy. However, it meant that when something happened to me, she had no chill. At all. At all. Ever. Ever. She could go from zero to psycho in about 00.3 seconds, and it was at times a little bit awe-inspiring when it wasn't directed at me. It was a bit hypocritical, though since she was abusing me herself, but apparently in her mind, she was the only person allowed to treat me like this. There was a particularly aggressive jerk that lived near my house. He hated me. I hated him, and it was a consistently escalating problem. I was almost never allowed to go outside as a child, so when he bullied me, it was always at school, and the staff turned a blind eye to it more often than not. Well, one day I came home from school, fifth grade, by the way, with a fat lip and a giant bruise on my face. My jerk had managed to catch me between classes and had taken the opportunity to beat me where nobody could see or report him for doing it. My grandmother snapped. She took me by the hand and we walked to the jerk's house, and I stood in the driveway watching her knock on the door. I was petrified at the time because I knew the mood she was in, and I was also scared of the jerk and his mom. I was a giant ball of vaguely human-shaped anxiety, and for good reason. Jerk's mom opened her door and looked at my grandmother, and the conversation went essentially as follows. It's been a long time so I can't entirely remember everything that was said. What? Serious disrespect in both tone and delivery. Your son put his hands on my little girl. And the witch didn't even try to deny it. She just lit herself a cigarette and blew the smoke in my grandmother's face, daring her to do something. Now, Grandma wasn't a big lady. She was average size and about 5'5 tall, so not particularly intimidating physically. The jerk's mom was a larger woman, about Grandma's height, but much heavier, outweighing Grandma by at least 60 LBs. So she was not impressed with Grandma showing up at her door, and she didn't care about her son's behavior or Grandma's feelings about it. This was a mistake because about a half second after the jerk's mom blew that smoke in Grandma's face, because Grandma didn't give her a single sound of warning before she snatched the jerk's mom up by her hair, dragged her out of her own house with it and onto her front porch, and then promptly threw her off it face first, following her down into the yard with murder in her eyes. It was a trailer porch. So it was actually a pretty decent drop, too, because their trailer was set up higher than normal. For my part, I was absolutely certain that the jerk's mom was going to die at the time. As I said, Grandma had issues, and that meant that when she snapped, she snapped, and when that happened, she was capable of almost anything. The jerk's mom took the fall like a trooper, though, and came up swinging. She managed to clip Grandma's cheek before Grandma managed to get a good hold on her hair again and use it to fling her on the ground again. Grandma hit her a few more times before she managed to pull Grandma down with her. The two of them were rolling around in the dirt like a pair of angry dogs, snarling and swearing and biting and clawing at each other. It got ugly, so very ugly. The jerk's mom was a tough cookie, though. I'll give her that. She was giving as good as she got for a hot minute, but she wasn't ready for what Grandma was capable of. They wrestled on the ground for a while, but Grandma finally got the jerk's mom on her back and started feeding her knuckle sandwich after knuckle sandwich after knuckle sandwich while sitting on her chest. Then the jerk's mom made a terrible mistake. See... She tried to use one of her legs to hook my grandmother and either flip her off or kick her in the face. 
I'm not sure which it was really. But the end result was that her bare foot was way too close to Grandma's mouth. Grandma's response was to turn her head and bite one of the jerk's mom's toes clean off at the joint and spit it right back into her face. I will never forget the look on the jerk's mom's face when it happened. It was a combination of incredulity, horror, and what just happened rapidly followed by pain because she started howling like a scalded cat and the whole time my grandmother was still screwing her up. Only now the jerk's mom wasn't trying to fight. She was just trying to get away because she finally realized that grandma was crazy and absolutely capable of killing her with a smile on her face and a song in her heart. This was the point that the cops showed up and separated the two of them, and they had to pry grandma's hands from around the jerk's mom's throat to do it. The jerk's mom was out cold by that point and purple, so one officer put my grandmother in the squad car with me beside her while the other called an ambulance for the jerk's mom and looked for her toe. Then came the explanations, and most people would have been screwed by that point. They really would. But grandma was without question the best actress that I have ever seen. If she'd used that skill in movies or theater, she would have been an Oscar winner, without a doubt. It was extraordinary. She could rewrite whole events. And even if you knew that she was lying, she'd end up having you believing her version and questioning your own memory and sanity. To this day, I have no clue how she did it. The story she spun for the cops was one of her greatest works of fiction. And this was how it went. Grandma claimed that I had come home from school after having been assaulted by jerks and that she'd wanted to speak with the jerk's mom about his behavior and try to work out something to correct the problem between our families in a responsible way. But when she knocked and the jerk's mom answered, the jerk's mom was hostile from the beginning and eventually became physically aggressive. When my grandmother said that either she dealt with her son or grandma would be informing the authorities immediately. Then came the big performance and what a performance it was. Tears started to trickle down grandma's face and she used her most quavery old lady voice to say that she and I had turned to go but that the jerk's mom pushed me off the porch, and after I hit the ground, she tried to do the same with Grandma, but the Grandma had grabbed her out of reflex as she went down. They'd ended up falling together with Grandma on top. Grandma claimed that the bruise that I had on my face came from the fall, not the previous altercation, and once they were on the ground, Grandma had just lost it. And could the officer really blame her? That woman had just assaulted her and her child, and she was only one old lady. She was so scared that if the jerk's mom got up, she'd hurt me or her, and Grandma wouldn't be able to stop her again because it was only luck that put her on top when they fell. All the while, she cried quietly. Not big sobs. Nothing showy. Just silent tears sliding down her face, and that tiny, quavery old woman voice as she apologized for her actions because she was just so scared. Then the officer looked at me and said, Is that what happened? It was a very scary moment for me. And while I'd like to say that I told the truth and that I did the right thing and was honest with the officer about what had happened, I can't because that would be a lie. I absolutely did not do any of those things. Instead, I looked at Grandma and let the fear and the stress of the situation just rise up and swallow me. And then I used that emotion to promptly burst into tears myself. I didn't really talk, just nodded my head and cried and clung to Grandma, who stroked my hair and rocked me back and forth while I was trying my best not to look the officer in the eyes. I knew I was nowhere near a good enough liar to pull it off if he was looking dead at me. So I hid my face against Grandma's shirt and just did my best to seem traumatized. He bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. The jerk's mom ended up being arrested for abuse of a child assault, disturbing the peace and possession of an illegal substance. Because when they searched her, they found a small bag of weed in her clothes. This all occurred in the mid-90s. So weed possession was no joke at the time and had heavy penalties. The jerk's mom also ended up being responsible for my grandmother's hospital bill for the sprained wrist she ended up with from pounding on the jerk's mom's face like a meat bongo. The toe never got reattached, and the jerk's mom ultimately ended up losing her job and going to actual jail for four months, and was on probation for like three years after. My grandmother didn't catch a single charge from that day's events, and the jerk's mom's family eventually moved from the trailer park, and I never saw any of them again afterwards. Morale of this story... Never screw with old trailer trash ladies. You might lose a toe. A little over 20 years ago, I trained to be an over-the-road driver at a trucking school, then got my first few jobs with various companies under a trainer. The long and the short of it is, I was not cut out to be a truck driver. My first trainer had a flat route, Jersey to Cali, then back. Total time, seven days. He made it abundantly clear that if I didn't get him back in seven days, there'd be hell to pay. So. After we got back and I crashed in my room for three days from paranoia and no sleep, I got back out there with another company, whose trainer goosed his rig to over 100M. Most know that there are governors on trucks that, at the time, won't let them go over 65 miles an hour in gear. This genius decided with a 40,000-pound load, 
to come rocketing out of the Denver Rockies at 65, shift the truck into neutral, and let gravity and Newton's laws speed the truck along. Okay, next company. The guy with the movies collection that filled my bunk, and a habit of spitting and chewing tobacco left, right, and sideways, was almost the deal breaker. When I was done with him, I decided to stay with the company, but asked for a new trainer waiting in a rinky-dink motel on a $50 per day leaning against my paycheck. After two weeks, watching trucks go in and out, I see this record dragging a truck and trailer into the lot. It literally looked like someone had picked the truck up, flipped it upside down, and ran it over a mandolin slicer. The cab, the engine, the whole thing just looked planned down to an exacto knife's angle. But I say to myself, I'll never be that dumb. To be clear, this was all before GPs, MapQuest, or Google Maps became popular. Back then, uh, McSaw rules stated that a driver could only ever work 10 hours a day. Trainers and trucking companies played with the numbers by figuring a truck could do 650 miles in that 10 hours. So that's what you had to do before you got out of the seat. Never mind that you can almost never start at 65E, nor stay at 65 MP without breaking some kind of law. You cook your logbooks by measuring your work time based on total miles traveled, then write the rest off as you eating, sleeping, or showering, so FMCSA slash DOT never wonder if you're being overworked. Essentially, your 10-hour day was usually 12-14 if you didn't break the law. Little wonder why regular coffee, Red Bull, and Monster Energy drinks were regularly going in and out of truck stops. Enter the line. The line was also a no-nonsense trainer. He wasn't a bad guy so long as you were booking miles. But as I started going, I started feeling myself slow down. I just didn't have the heart to keep doing this. When I got tired from driving, I started to slip into sleep. The constant drone of the engine the white lines on the road blinking in and out of sight. It happens sadly. If it ever happens to you, don't brush it off. Pull over and get some sleep or get out of the vehicle to wake yourself up. Well, the line didn't like that one bit. My last day with him, I'm somewhere near Chicago, on a highway I don't remember getting on. That was pitch black, save for my headlights. I know I was headed to Chicago, but not where I was or how I was supposed to get there. I managed to just barely pull the truck back onto the road after drifting over the hazard bumps in the road. Trust me. The road to hell isn't paved with good intentions. It's just paved. I stopped the truck, walked back to the sleeper, and woke him up. Listen, I'm exhausted. I can't even understand that anymore. I don't know where I'm going. I gotta get some sleep. What? What? Look, just keep driving till you get to the stop, then sleep. The line tells me, dude, I'm passing out behind the wheel. I barely got us back onto the road once. Does it make sense to play with both our lives for a load? This is my truck. So you have two choices. Drive this truck or grab your stuff and get out here. And if this little thought enters your head again, just remember that wherever you stop next, that isn't our drop. It's where you get out. For a moment, I want to just rage at the guy, but I know I'll never get anywhere. But anger brings a wonderful clarity to the mind. So where I stop next is where I get out? Okay, boss. And on my location, I checked our delivery point and realized that I must have missed some turnoff because we were supposed to drop somewhere outside of Chicago but I was still headed towards it. But Chicago had what I wanted, a Greyhound bus stop. So I drove three more hours, focused on ending this misery. We had a satellite uplink to our dispatcher and I, being tech savvy and pissed enough, put on some of my music to cover any beeps from it. Cause boy was I off the route. I pull into the bus terminal right next to a parked patrol car, shut the truck down and start grabbing my gear. The line wakes up as he hears me packing. So we're there, he says while yawning. Nope, nope. What? What? I told you that if you stop this truck again outside of the stop, you were getting out. He screamed at me. I grabbed the sleeper curtain and flung it wide open to show the bus terminal. I found your term acceptable. This is where I'm getting out. The line starts to get up with fury in his eyes. And though he was smaller than me, it's clear he wasn't letting size dictate anything. Neither was I as I flashed my law book in his face. It's going to be an interesting discussion with that officer there. How you've had me driving for the last 14 hours straight, even when I told you I was too tired to drive. The line glares at me like he was trying to pull me by thought alone. You'll never work as a driver again. I promise you. I smile again, a mix of cheer, madness, and rage in my little laugh that makes even the line move back. I've since developed a laugh that could make Mark Hamill's Joker think twice in the right moment. Again, something we wholeheartedly agree on. By the way, dispatch might want a word with you. I know where we are. That's not our drop point. I climb out of the truck and he speeds off in the early morning. Turns out the cop car was empty because the officer went inside to use the bathroom. But I borrowed some money from my mother, who was all too eager to get me back to Jersey after what I told her. Slept for four hours on the terminal floor before my bus. 
best days sleep of my life. To be fair, I understand the industry is getting better with more precise jeepsing and smartphones that can keep drivers in touch no matter what. The days of drivers being worked till they crash is slowly coming to an end. But that's also why trucking's now paying $70,000 for a driver with five years and no accidents. There's very few that weren't trained to treat their rigs as a bumper car. I drove the truck one last time as a wildcatter on. Call to deliver stuff to Delaware. Not a bad job, but I realized trucking just wasn't for me. I got into computing and haven't looked back since. My girlfriend is an assistant manager at a nationwide pizza chain named after a beloved tile-based game. She was hired by the regional manager and placed at this particular store. The store manager meets her first day and there's constant tension. He routinely undermines her authority to other employees. He mocked another deaf employee by mimicking her speech pattern, leading to said employee quitting. He says he can't understand Latino customers that try to order on the phone so that he can hang up and is just in general an insensitive jerk. The final straw came when late one night last week, a black gentleman and Asian gentleman came in to order. The Asian gentleman is visibly intoxicated, so the black gentleman sets him down in a chair and places their order. Because of COVID-19 precautions, customers aren't technically supposed to sit inside right now, but they're not causing any problems. They're the only customers in this store, and my girlfriend is by herself. She gets to making their order when the jerk manager comes back from a delivery. They have trouble keeping drivers shocker. He immediately tells them they can't sit in the store. As the black gentleman questions why, the jerk escalates and gets louder. This devolves rather quickly to the jerk manager yelling at them to get out of my store, at which time the black gentleman says he will when he gets a refund. A refund is issued on his card, but he wants a receipt as proof. The manager refuses and tells them they're trespassing. He follows them out to the parking lot, still yelling, and then calls the police to report them for alleged trespassing. As he comes back in, he mumbles the N-word in front of my also-black girlfriend. She writes a two-page memo to the human resources outlining his offenses and sends it to the regional manager. The next day, she asks the jerk manager to bring her some dough. He's across the kitchen, more than ten feet away, and her back is to him. The dough whizzes by her ear and slams out of the table next to her. He threw food across the kitchen at her. Just then, the regional manager walks in to get product for another store. She asks to speak with him and the jerk manager's face turns ashen. It turns out that the regional manager never got the email, so my girlfriend fills him in and resents the email. She went home for the day and was told that the jerk manager will be out for some family stuff, which we assume was code for suspension. The very next day, my girlfriend is working with the jerk manager's young protege. He follows right along with whatever the elder jerk says, laughing at all his jokes, etc. The young jerk has a habit of falsifying the delivery times. He'll tell the customer it'll be 45 minutes, then wait 20 to actually enter the order so that they get 25 minutes delivery time and the store's numbers look good. Mind you, this is only rewarded with the manager getting a bonus. So not sure why he'd risk his job for this jerk, but I digress. My girlfriend had told the training manager about this practice just the day before. So last night, my girlfriend went out to move her car to the front of the building so that it will be under the street light out front once it's dark, as she'll be closing and won't leave until 2, um, after only 6 minutes. We were on the phone and had the exact call time. Baby Jerk leaves the store unattended to ask her for her employee number so that he can clock her out for her break. Mind you, she's the manager on duty. He's just the guy that answers the phone. She tells him she's on her way back in now and to go cover the store. Around 11 p.m., Baby Jerk asks my girlfriend to enter a falsified order. She says no, that's against store policy. Well, Baby Jerk didn't like that one bit. He storms off in a huff and sits down in the back and eats what was left of his lunch. After being by herself during a rush for more than 20 minutes, my girlfriend finds him and ever so sweetly asks if he's clocked out for his break. Well, Baby Jerk didn't like his own medicine one bit. He gets pissy and says he's got to go. Family emergency and clocks out. Now, during this time, another friend of ours that is also a black woman has entered the store. She's actually been recommended as an employee to the regional manager and was supposed to go for orientation today. Although, as you'll see shortly, that didn't come to fruition. I only mention this to say that she has the regional manager's phone number. That's a surprise tool that will help us later. Baby Jerk is now clocked out for a supposed emergency, but takes the time to tell the black woman that she's not allowed to stand there. She was standing at the plexiglass partition on the customer side, chatting with my girlfriend as she continued to work through orders by herself. My girlfriend tells him that she's fine and she can be there. Leave her alone. Baby Jerk takes after his mentor and escalates a non-problem into a full-blown altercation. The black woman asks for his name, saying that she's going to report him to the regional manager and uses the regional manager's first name to imply that she knows him. He refuses, and my girlfriend gives his first name. Baby Jerk then loses it, saying he's reporting my girlfriend to the human resources for giving out my first and last name. My girlfriend laughs at him, says she didn't. We can run the tapes back if you want. 
What he fails to realize is he's not important enough for my girlfriend to have even learned his last name. She couldn't have told her if she'd wanted to. Baby Jerk isn't having it and says he's going to call the police on the black woman for trespassing. Sound familiar? My girlfriend asks the black woman to please leave before anything unwarranted happens. As she walks out, Baby Jerk follows her to her car, still talking crap and threatening to call the police. A six foot three, 300 pounds. White man followed a 5'5", 110 ill black woman back to her car at midnight. After getting into her car, the black woman informs him that she feels threatened and is armed. This being a too friendly state, she's well within her rights to do so. At this point, little baby jerk is scared and begins calling the police to report the scary black woman trespassing and threatening him. He takes a picture of her license plate and walks out into the parking lot. Lo and behold, who should be outside the store that he's legally forbidden from coming to, but Big Daddy Jerk turns out he'd been parked outside for the last 30 minutes, or so directly next to my girlfriend's car. Daddy and Baby Jerk put their heads together and come up with a good story for the cops as the black woman leaves. My girlfriend had called me and asked me to come up to the store as she didn't feel safe knowing that Daddy Jerk was suspended and lurking in the parking lot at midnight next to her car. I pull in just as our black woman friend is leaving and I catch the tail end of the phone call to the police. As Baby Jerk tells them that her boyfriend just pulled up and describes my car, I park, leave my pistol in the glove box and go into the store. I told my girlfriend that Baby Jerk just called the police and I placed an order for a pizza to have a reason to hang around. My girlfriend is still alone in the building working through the orders by herself while Baby Jerk is outside for his family emergency, plotting with Daddy Jerk. Three officers arrive and ask to speak with my girlfriend. They wait patiently for her to finish putting the last pizza in the oven. They ask if our friend had threatened Baby Jerk. My girlfriend says no, adding that we can check the cameras if they'd like. The officer said that wouldn't be necessary and implied that they were just going to take a report and that nothing would come of it. They're tired of being called to this same store for nonsensical people of color trespassing calls, this being the second one in three days, and yet another in a long line. The police finish taking statements not even asking for our friend's name, because they're not going to follow up on it, and leave. One of the delivery drivers has come back and helps my girlfriend finish a few orders, but it's time for him to go home. Baby Jerk has made his way back inside the store at this point, and my girlfriend asks the driver to call the next manager at the store down the road to come down. The driver responds that said manager is in the parking lot. Turns out, he's out there chatting with Eddie Jerk. The driver needs to be checked out before he can leave. Baby Jerk pipes up that he can check him out. Mind you, only a manager can do that, and Baby Jerk isn't even on the clock as he had a family emergency. My girlfriend says, no, I can do that, and goes outside with the driver. Baby Jerk follows right behind and looks at me. Seeing a bald white man and expecting an ally, and says, Sorry, I guess our assistant manager is going outside. Shrugging his shoulders leaving me alone in the store. Mind you, I've been standing in the store for 30 minutes now and no one has told me I couldn't be there. After the driver has been checked out and left, my girlfriend, the manager from the nearest store and Baby Jerk come back inside. Baby Jerk proceeds to lay out his plan to report my girlfriend to the human resources for something. My girlfriend calmly says that it's not true and once again, we can watch the tapes. Baby Jerk starts cursing and flipping my girlfriend off and manager from the nearest store who's afraid of confrontation is practically begging Baby Jerk to leave. He storms out, gets in his car, and pulls right up behind my girlfriend's car, blocking her in, talking to Daddy Jerk, who's still lurking outside. My girlfriend asked me to go outside and make sure they're not vandalizing her car. So I lean against my car across the parking lot and glare at them silently while pleasantly smiling. They finish up their conversation and both drive slowly away. My girlfriend tells the manager from the nearest store that she doesn't feel safe as Daddy Jerk feels very comfortable lurking by her car in the dark, and that manager didn't do anything to make him leave. My girlfriend tells manager that she's leaving and not finishing her shift. Manager from the nearest store says that he'll have to write up both Baby Jerk and my girlfriend for not working as a team. After we get home, manager from the nearest store texts and asks to set a mediation between the two tomorrow. Daybreak comes and my girlfriend gets a call from the regional manager that hired her. He wants to hear from her what happened. My girlfriend explains the whole situation with the regional manager fluctuating between various states of incredulity. When she gets to the part about Daddy Jerk being outside in the parking lot at midnight, I could hear the regional manager say what? Over the phone. I hadn't been able to hear him before that. Turns out, neither Baby Jerk nor manager from the nearest store had mentioned in their statements that Daddy Jerk was on the premises. Since he was already suspended, he wasn't supposed to be on the property at all. That clearly shows that they were all colluding together in this situation. The regional manager says there's no need for a mediation meeting after all or writing her up and thanks my girlfriend for letting him know. A short while later, in the WhatsApp group that the managers share, a message was sent out stating that Daddy Jerk was suspended indefinitely 
and wasn't allowed at any franchise location, even as a customer. If he was seen, he should be reported to the police and regional manager immediately. No word yet on baby jerk punishment. But my girlfriend was sent to a different store today and loves it. Helpful co-workers, great manager, better store in every way. I'm just glad she's having a better night than last night. Unfortunately, like most industries, the hospitality field is rife with subtle and overt racism, especially in the South where a certain subset of customers just like to be served by people of color. Reminds them of the good old days, I suppose. Luckily, it seems that these feelings were lower in the command chain, and we were able to go high enough to get someone that will actually take our concerns to heart. That being said, witnesses and evidence are your greatest tool. Please, stand up for what is right. Don't just let moments like these pass by is not my problem. Races feel emboldened now more than ever and need to be brought back to reality. 